All right, hey, welcome to Vidra, please. Once again, everybody, we uh, we appreciate you tuning in for the wide world of the internet. My name is Joseph. I'm your co-host, Peter. Peter, welcome back once again. Yeah, delight to, to to see you digitally. You know, it's been a it's been a tough and productive week in our real lives. We were just commiserating before we started, and now we've we've taken our professional hats off so that we can you know dredge up. Uh, some some '90s sci-fi television and bitch about it on the internet for an hour uh, to dozens of our fans. So, what do you mean taking our professional hats off? Are are you not getting paid for this? <laughs> In fact, I am paying for this. I am paying for the privilege to entertain others. Let me tell you, I need to turn you on to this new thing. It's called Schadenfreude, and knowing that people out there are getting all wound up about us hating on their jam. Uh, pays in dividends. It's, it's wonderful. And it's been a bit since I've gone to to Reddit and kind of rubbed my my metaphorical ball sack all over them. You know, I, I can see yeah. I can see what happens with that again. You know, dangerous territory. I don't think you're gonna like uh, what you bring back. You might end up with some of this uh, space elf caretaker flu on your balls. Be careful. <laughs> well, we we understand that that doesn't necessarily need to be treated to go away. You know, you can be asymptomatic of that apparently for years at a time. That never yeah. gets addressed. And that's going to play into this episode because, uh, yeah, you've got a patient zero there still rocking caretaker flu. And she's a big part of this episode. Too. So we'll, we'll have to circle back around to that. I want to, I want to start just by talking about how we received the episode. Cause I'm going to, be unabashed in my appreciation for this one. I really liked it, and my wife absolutely loved it. And um, you're going to have to restrain me from overpraising it. Oh, I'll be happy to restrain you on that. <laughs> um, because, uh, well, I'll, I'll save my full thoughts for the very end. I think it's nice and we let the listeners kind of start drawing their own conclusions before we heavily taint it too much so i'll I'll hold my final thoughts until the end but um it never ceases to amaze me since we started this how divergent our opinions tend to be because i knew before i even talked to you about this before i even opened my mouth like i bet peter hated this i kind of knew but i didn't understand why well, here it is, season two, episode thirteen. Faces. Well, that's not. That's not true. This is season one, episode thirteen. Ah, what am I doing? Faces. What am I doing? I'm going crazy over here. I was trying to get some of this misery out of the way. I was, I was wandering. I was putting my mind in a, a more hopeful place. Uh, yeah, season one, episode thirteen. Faces. Thirteen of these episodes under our belt now. Technically fourteen. Go ahead and start us off. Well, the start of the episode is kind of abrupt because this is probably the shortest pre credit sequence we've seen on the show. A few seconds of what looks like a laboratory scene. And we get a slow camera pan up as an off screen voice uh, calls to Bolana for her to pay attention slash wake up. And Bolana lifts her head to reveal that it's a fully Klingon Bolana. It's a fully caveman Bolana. Yeah, we, we're, we're rocking that whole, as Voltaire would say, a uh, lobster on the head. Where we are, we are full, uh, a heavy metal samurai style Klingon for Bolana. Not that, not a little bit of ridge, ridge action. We got the, we have the full rack of rack of ribs up there. That's it. It cuts cuts right to the credits after that. They're uh, they're definitely just saying, here's what's up with this. Now let's have a shitty scene with two Avak and Neelix. Talking about some fucking soup, soup made and ruined. So, first of all, I want to say these uh, these Netflix we're watching on Netflix. I, I assume you're watching on Netflix too. Yeah. These uh, intros I can be really shitty, man. Like the the little line they give, like right in there they say Vidian. Such so why are you gonna let the cat out of the bag? Sure, you're dealing with them the whole episode, but like, come on, man, you, you completely take the edge off the opening of some of these things. And I'll get into some thoughts on the Vidians here in a second. But that little soup scene we chime in on. Have you noticed there's like a soup fetish on the ship yet? Yeah, well, there, we've had two solid mentions of it. I wouldn't necessarily call two mentions a fetish. 
three dudes. Because just... look, we got right off the bat was Paris and his shitting on the tomato soup. Right. Uh, then there was Janeway ordering uh, chicken soup to drink like coffee when she was having her oh, chat with yeah. Cass. That's and right. Then we've got That's right. Chicote and his stolen mushroom soup. Now we got number four is the Vulcan soup, which I thought was kind of shitty. Like they're rubbing it right in like Chicote's face. Like, oh, when your friends make you soup, it's like, you know, insubordination. We're calling for criminal charges. But, you know, Neelix can just make special novelty soup for whoever he decides. I, I tend to agree with your reasoning there, though. You ask your wife to to act uh, to dress like a, a French maid once or twice, it's not a fetish. But once you hit four times, yeah, it's a fetish now. Someone in you that writer room loves soup, and they want you to love soup, too. It's like that sketch from 30 Rock. Like, that's the guy you don't want to have ordering lunch because he's always going to go with the soup place, and it's like you're really fucking tired of it. So it just manifests itself in the script that he submits. It's like, god damn it. Sure. Charlie, with the fucking, with the goddamn soup references, Jesus. So th- this Tuvok uh, soup scene, it's predated by a little tip off um, by Janeway where she gives us captain's log that they're in the whatever system doing a system survey, which again, seems like a big waste of fucking time for me because, you know, shouldn't you be flying home? And also they left an away team on some rando planet surface to investigate magnesite formations. That is what the captain log says. And why the fuck would you leave three of your officers on a random planet in, you know, the Delta Quadrant, AKA the danger zone? Let's back this up. What three people from your starship did you leave to study rock formations in fucking cave planet. I mean, and it's one thing if this is like, you know, you're the big D and you're rolling around doing your science missions in the Alpha Quadrant because that's your job. But you're supposed to be going home. So unless like you've got a little bit of a reason of like maybe these rocks or space rocks that make your engine go faster or some shit that'll actually facilitate you going home sooner. Why in the hell are you leaving anyone there at all? And for, furthermore, again, as in every episode, this quadrant is filled with things that want to kill you. So why are you just leaving three dudes to hang out there by themselves with their hand phasers, their tricorders, and you know, and some and, fucking ration packs you left them with? Stupid flashlights, too. Don't forget those. I, I want to look at the three people that they left here. You left Tom Paris, the guy who is in charge of driving your ship. You left Bolana Taurus, the lady who is in charge of making sure your ship can go. And you yes. left Fred Durst. The guy who's in charge <laughs> of doing it all for the nookie. All right. <laughs> How are you going to get back with no nookie? What? Did they just, I hope, you know, Tom had the good sense to beam down with Voyager's car key. So just in case something bad happens, like they really have to come back and get his ass. Like leaving him behind is just a complete no go. Let, let me go ahead and just get this out of the way here. You know what my problems with this episode moving forward are. I believe that fundamentally we've got a good episode conceptually on our hands is, but just every detail opportunity they have or every opportunity detail that they have to kind of steer this episode in the same direction, they just completely neglect and, and, and pull something terrible out of their butt instead and set it on the table and say, that was the reason why this happened. Like, why are you just goofing around in this system? Why are you leaving a stranded away team? You know, all the times you've used the shuttle so far, let them have the shuttle so they can get away just in case. You're just beaming people down into what could be another spider asteroid, uh, you know, space spider asteroid. And as we move into the Vidians, you know, which obviously cats out of the bag, thanks to the Netflix introduction, I get that the Vidians are bad guys. I get that they're villains. And I get that this episode is really built around ramping them up to like evil monster status, which is a shame because for me personally as a viewer, the more I can sympathize for, a, you know, a villain, I think the better that villain becomes and the more interesting they become. Um, I think that you're um, – I think you're underselling the head fake that happens later in the episode and that – you know, let's let's go through it when we get there. I'll, I'll make the point. But 
I think they try to actually give you some sympathy to start for the Vidians. And then they flip it because they're so twisted from what has happened to them that it it seems impossible for them to be normal anymore. Well, the issue I'm going to have with this, and I'm going to bring it up a couple times here, and and I think the the moral of the story is that the Vidians are fucking stupid and that they are victims of their own (laughs) stupidity. And they do the most stupidest things at the most stupidest times uh, for the most stupidest of results. And that is the Vidians, the stupids. They have arrived at the planet where they stranded three of their perfectly good officers in the danger zone. And, oh no, guess what? They're not where they're supposed to be. And Chakotay straight out says, this must be because of the, the impenetrable space rocks we found there. We knew this could happen. Did you know that his favorite food that Neelix made him was corn salad? I was about to say, I, I, I thought it was mushroom soup. I thought we learned that a few weeks no, ago. No, mushroom soup isn't Native American enough. They had to up the ante and involve corn directly. Why would <laughs> why would Chakotay have had something be favorite like mushroom soup or, you know, escargot or a hamburger? That's so not Native American. No, it's actually corn sa- salad. So just wanted to get that out of the way. But anyways, yeah. <laughs> They uh, they send Chakotay and Kim and Tuvok down to find the guys after they see some shits shifted with the rocks and they have this whole plan to be able to beam them back out. But that scene uh, wipes to the reveal that we're dealing with the Vidians again and that this guy named Sulan, who's fucking creepy as shit, has some real fucking creepy latex on his face, uh, has – Done some real interesting medical uh, techniques to Balana to turn her into a full Klingon. I appreciated the explanation. I have reconstituted your genome. You are now purely Klingon. That's not possible. I assure you it is. I have developed a procedure to stimulate cell division. A kind of enhanced mitosis. Your Klingon genetic material was extracted. It was then converted from matter to energy by our genetron. Finally, you were rematerialized as the purified Klingon specimen that you are now. And it, it makes sense in context of what we understand so far about replicator and, tr- and transporter technology and how it can... Uh, disassemble and reassemble life forms and how the replicator can replicate biological uh, uh, organs and that sort of thing. The, the doctors talked about it. The Federation can even do that. At that point, Bolana the Klingon, who – looking pretty foxy for a Klingon. I'm not going to lie. Um, oh, she, it, something she's happy to utilize later. <laughs> Yeah, that was kind of – so my wife's watching this episode with me. She she hasn't really sat in for a while. Uh, for whatever reason, she decided to sit in on this one. Uh, some real keen observations here that uh, the Vidians look like old zits. And she's saying that in a very flattering way. Uh, they – the, the for as, as shitty as so many of these – literally shitty in the case of the shitheads, as some of these aliens have looked, they knock it out of the park with these Vidians. Every time, every character they show in Vidian makeup just looks revolting and gross. And, you know, it's this fine line between the monster and different too. later on in the episode. There's one of these guards who uh, I don't know. I think he goes to boss Paris around or something. This dude just has this massive crater missing out of the side of his face and it just looks awesome. But uh, so there's there's Balana and she's laying on the table. We get a real good view of her mouth, which I thought uh, was Interesting to see that, like, she has been reconstituted Klingon essentially in a vacuum. She is, for all intents and purposes, a newborn Klingon, right? And her teeth just look like they are made out of wood. Worf was a full-blooded Klingon. He had, like, pretty nice teeth, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, he was the exception, though. Almost every other Klingon actor has had these these dental, you know, prosthetics they wear and kind of, like, fang-like teeth. Roxanne Dawson clearly had difficulty acting through those teeth in that first scene. She's like throwing a word for a little bit, trying to get them out. Like it's, she got better with them clearly after and in subsequent scenes. I guarantee you that one was probably filmed first based on how hard she was struggling with it. 
But anyways, but, so he lays out the you know what happened. What you just covered is, uh, I sucked you up into this machine. We separated the Klingon part out, and then we basically rematerialized you with transporter technology. At that point, like she should have closed her eyes and was like, "Shit," because in my book, guess who's in the Chakotay, Tuvok, Harry Kim, <laughs> No Soul Club. I was about to say the same thing, man. Like two weeks ago, we were postulating about like, do what did the transporter kill you and all this other stuff about uh, you know the whole soul. But man, what do you do with this? She died. Uh, you know, she done died, and there is no soul. You now have a a meat suit, Balana Taurus Klingon edition. I think this uh, this whole episode, of course, you know the way that the arc of Balana goes the arc Bellana goes through in this suggests you know she's half of a whole mm-hmm. so i don't think she's necessarily soulless i think that the inherent imperfection in the process that we end up seeing happen here suggests a a metaphysical unity between uh Bellana, uh you know uh background um so i don't think that she's soulless i think that uh if anything it it subtly suggests that in fact that she's a soul divided in this episode but how is she divided i disagree uh, we have it for the record her her soul is gone in my book and and how is she divided L- let's check in on some of our other uh imprisoned crew members namely a uh, mr paris yeah we see uh paris and and fred durst uh <laughs> Uh, get 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 uh, brought into this this sterile looking barracks by some Vidian guards. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, I gotta cut you off. I gotta cut you off. I want to go ahead and uh, point out that we have the triumphant return of uh, Candy Corn Tragedy slash uh, Phage. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The 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 Cardassian hallway reuse triumphant yes, return. They, Very happy. Yeah, yeah. There's only so many studio spots on those on those lots. You know, at Paramount, and so they, you know, they uh, they spare. I'm sure they're sharing some space with the S9. Yeah. So I'm not surprised to see that hallway make a its third appearance here in the first season. Mm-hmm. That's it's 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 the true unsung hero of Voyager season one. We will have a replicator. It needs a drama. credit. It needs a credit after after Ethan Phillips as Neelix. Mm-hmm. It's like that one same fucking Cardassian hallway that keeps showing up. Special guest star, Cardassian hallway. But, uh, you know, Fred Durst, he's ready to throw down. He's ready to mosh pit with these Vidians. But Tom's like, no, nah, man, they got guns. We got to we got to pick our spots and, and figure out what we got to do to get out of here. Yeah, and but he's like, but look, plays, man, next time this guy shoves me, it's going to be my way or the highway. It, <laughs> it's got that gold uniform on. Mm-hmm. It's, it's it's just you it's know it's not happen. gonna go well it's waiting to happen you know it's not gonna go well you, you don't have to watch this episode to know you know fred's not gonna be with us much longer now there's apparently some rando snarf snarf here uh that is extremely unhelpful at first painful to watch too it's like he's doing this, <laughs> this dude that they got done up what are they talaxians it's like he's doing a bad impression of neelix and uh, it is miserable. Congratulations to the guy for really capturing the deepest disgust of uh, what Talaxians seem to be at their core. But a little bit too much screen time from this guy. And, and what I like is they show you him a few times and even goes an extra mile later on in the episode, like, you know, given water and a lot of helpful advice. And this guy really rolls out the red carpet for the Starfleet crews and they just leave this fucking dude to die. <laughs> Well, they never explain why he turns around and, and starts helping them out anyway. But yeah, they do totally leave this guy to have his organs taken by the Vidians. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, t- Tom's busy trying to plan a prison breakout, though. That man knows prison breakouts. Yeah. So he's he's trying to figure some shit out. And, but he kind of just accepts that the Talaxian is like telling him that Bolana's probably already dead. And he's like, all right, me and Fred got to get the fuck out of here then. <laughs> we we got to stick it. We got to stick it in there. Yeah. But, uh, you know. Paris has had enough of prison, and uh, rather than wait for Mama Janeway to come save him a second time from the pokey, he's uh, he's trying to motivate <laughs> some people here. That's, that's good. It's good. Um, but, you know, Mama Janeway is – they do send a Scooby squad. Uh, so they're down with their useless fucking flashlights trying to figure out what happened, and they're shocked to find evidence – that the fucking away team they left on a planet they'd never seen before in the danger quadrant where everyone is trying to fucking kill them have been fucking kidnapped. Now, Mind you, they've already encountered multiple hostile races that would have reason to do this. Mm-hmm. Multiple. 
And they're like, oh, how did this happen? I'm like, I don't know. Was it the Kazon? Was it the Vidians? Is it those dudes you fucking stole from and then left all your Shakespeare and shit for? The Skivians? Yeah. Like, could be any of them. Well, I don't know if it could be anyone. The, the away team, the bad luck committee returns with the Tuvok, Chakotay, um pity party now featuring their soulless brother uh, <laughs> it's the soulless tria yeah yeah, yeah. with kim yeah well basically they heard that you know torres got scooped up into a computer dematerialized and rebuilt as a lifeless husk uh and they're just off to welcome their new system into the soulless club uh but no i want to say you know yeah you just pointed out some some pretty heavy hitters that we've met in the delta quadrant i don't think it could be any of them the case in point the Skevians have yet to be encountered in caves. Uh, however, we do have equal amounts of cave encounters with the Kazon and the Vidians. Uh, so they should be seeing some pretty obvious trends here if uh, they're going to be skulking about in some caves and find crew members missing. They cut back to the laboratory scene. Now, Sulan is the head uh, surgeon of the Vidians. He, he is doing experimentation to this Klingon up Balana uh, on the theory that Klingon DNA, because it's super hardy, might be resistant to the phage. So that's the underlying reason why he's doing this. And um, he, he gives off a real like the torturer from the Princess Bride vibe. He's he's like creepy uh, in a in a, a way that you would expect a, a dude who spends his entire life doing desperate experimentation to save his people might, and that he's kind of lost the thread on, on any kind of like personal morality, but he has the greater goal in mind. The sacrificing scientist category breaks down into two types. And, you know, we're talking about the guys that are, again, uh, inflicting pain and suffering on others, but it's for uh, an ultimate objective good goal. You've got the first camp that's just their clinical doing the thing. They know what they're doing is wrong, and, and it's a pretty uh, cold indifference. The second camp to which I believe this guy belongs in are the type that can't talk to the captor in any body position other than like craned over the person's restrained form and like talking sideways down to them within like a two foot gap. That's precisely how it happens here precisely he is that kind of guy i kind of i like sulan i do too i i think that he's a very compelling and interesting villain in that he's not without sympathy so you get a little bit of that here where this is his goal his goal is that balana might be the savior of his entire race and he hasn't told anybody yet but he's excited at the prospect and balana seems to be fighting the phage off successfully because she's been infected by it Sulan is also clearly giving a I want to fuck this Klingon vibe off. He's interested in her uh, and is clearly very awkward in expressing it because he is, of course, a horrific monster. <laughs> so you get a little bit of that, right? And they kind of leave that with you. Did you get a rapey vibe off of him? I didn't get a rapey vibe. I didn't either. And I, I, thought... got an, I, got, I got an awkward neckbeard vibe. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a good way to put it. Um... But, you know, he does some exposition here. He he helps you appear a little bit further beyond the 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 veil as to what these Vidians are about. I don't think they flesh him out much more than they did in the initial encounter with the Vidians of Phage. And I think that's kind of a – I think that was kind of a missed opportunity. Um, I think this would have been a good place to talk about at what age, you know, do Vidian children contact – Get the Phage. Get the I think right, you could have scored yeah. a lot of sympathy points here. Um and I don't really think he sells his mission to Balana super well. Uh, I don't want to go too far off track here, but uh, a lot of what he was laying down started coming off feeling like General Zod from that uh, the the Superman, the last, which one was it? Man of Steel. Was it Man of Steel? Yeah. Um, you know, Zod had a pretty noble goal, and like he sold it to Superman in the worst fucking light possible uh, and instead of, you know, getting someone to kind of be reasonable, hey, you know. Zod's Zod's way he was going to accomplish that goal, though, was incredibly unreasonable and in killing everyone on Earth. Whereas Sulan, to this point, has not even said, like, I'm going to, you know, like, even kill you personally. It's it's just you are potentially the key. You could be a hero to my whole race. He's really selling, upselling this. Like, 
he's being extremely reasonable given the circumstances that like you could save every one of my people. So, hey, yeah. hang in there, please. The, the important things to miss here is he could have been like, and this is going to start touching and the, the Vidians are stupid. If he was like, hey, look, I got your friends. You're looking super promising. Play ball with me. Help me work through this thing. And not only am I going to let you go and, and maybe even turn you back into the way you were if you want. I'm going to let all your friends go. You're going to save tons of lives. And think about all the other people we've had to like, you know, skin scavenge to keep ourselves alive. Like you are going to be the hero of the Delta Quadrant. And you are going to stop so many other people from getting hurt and suffering. That's a hard. That's hard to argue with. But just being like vaguely threatening and whatnot, like some real missed opportunities here for the the Vidian brownie points. I think that the point is though that is Sulan is too like the whole Vidian race is too far gone for the most part in having to have dealt with this generations long. I think they said thousands of years. In, in the first time we met them of this of the phage to think like that anymore like they're so geared towards survival that that's why ultimately what we see happen happens is that they don't think or feel or act like normal people anymore or truly understand in context their depravity which is why they're tragic instead of just evil at least in my opinion I think they're just really bad salesmen from what I've seen so far. That opinion is going to change a little later in the episode. But for now, you've got uh, fully Klingon Taurus uh, somewhat restrained by some tin foil pins on this table. But there's another Taurus. Yeah. So next scene we see is this a humanoid female figure starting to try and wake Tom Paris up. And Tom wakes up to see a very familiar yet unfamiliar looking person. It looks like Torres if Torres was 100% human. Less hot. <laughs> so Torres uh, is, is, you know, Roxana Dawson didn't have to sit in the makeup chair uh, for these, for, the, for this part of the shoot. Uh, it's human Torres. And we start to get some, some dialogue in the next scene where she is explaining what happened from her perspective and hats off and props indeed to Roxana Dawson for this whole episode, because by this point you start to see the subtlety in her performance and how she is playing both sides differently. And that the Klingon version of her is very Klingon, very aggressive. She even speaks in the same clipped way that most Klingon characters do uh, throughout Berman era Trek. And then the human version of her is much more emotional, uh, you know, much more a giant sissy. I, I thought the way that she split the characters up, you know, the Klingon part came off feeling pretty Mary Sue to me. And the human was just a emotional liability, weak, like all of the bad parts of her left over. Um, you know, she starts talking to Tom and shoehorns this uh, daddy issues story in. Like before checking in about anything else, you know, what the conditions of anybody else are if he's made any plans to escape how to talk to it's like right out of the gate she's like hey tom wake up let me uh let me start getting real emotional on you so i'm gonna talk for a second about why my my wife absolutely adored this episode she's watched every one with me so far so she's been into the duration this is her favorite and uh i was like really she's like yeah i mean you know you try being a mixed race person from a, a broken household and this sort of thing's going to speak to you. The parts of yourself that are at war, that that not feeling wanted, all of all of that. So I certainly understand where you're coming from on it because this isn't something I've ever had to deal with. But because I had the good fortune of watching it with somebody who comes from it from perspective that I think it was aimed at, totally different experience for her. So I get what you're saying. Like, it almost seems like the human part of her is purposefully weak and all this. But but Stevie really looked at it as interpreting it, I think, the way it was intended to be interpreted in terms of her as the 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 archetypal real world, world version of what Bolana is in this this uh, series. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I just think that the uh, I don't know. I, I, I Again, I, I feel that that there was nothing good about the human side. She could, uh, you know, she could use computers and read a language that she had never been exposed to ever before. And that's something I want to jump into a little bit. Oh, let's oh, talk sure. about it now. You yeah. know, at a certain point she gets off and 
starts doing some stuff, she's able to interface with these computer panels with no problems, despite never having encountered Vidian uh, technology before. So let's say that, you know, this dude did split out. Sulan did split Balana in two. Does that mean like both sides got a copy of the universal translator? And does the universal translator, like, is there like an eye overlay that maybe like decodes text or something? Something that gets installed in an episode, we see it get installed into some people in uh, season two. So mm-hmm. I'll be interested to see that again. Who knows? It would actually be interesting if they ever addressed that. I, I'm not in an agreement that Bolana, like the whole, I think the whole human part of Bolana is the more like uh, she's using reason. She's more responsive to her emotions. Uh, she obviously has her intellect where obviously the Klingon part of her is extremely aggressive, headstrong and brave and, and accomplished and effective. I mean, her, the Klingon way certainly was the right way through the majority of the episode. Uh, let me ask you this. If we're going to talk about Bolana Torres um, character growth, does she acknowledge past this point that the humans around her are especially brave and especially great because she is now experienced to be a human and maybe not in control of your emotions has some of the stuff. And let's, let's chalk it up to that. It's like a data, like, Oh, this is the first time I've really been put in a um, encounter with, with raw emotions. It's overwhelming. I'm undisciplined and really having right. a rain. In. That's what I think you know, it is. The same, the same. Yeah. But they don't actually point that out. Like she could they have been do, like, Oh, Paris. They, they do. She talks about how – I mean they never use explicit dialogue but I think it's portrayed in the performance where she's – she doesn't have that bulwark that she feels that she should have. And so she's really like, why am I melting down? I don't I don't understand why I'm doing this. And it's because she's incomplete going back to what we were saying before about I, how – She's undertrained and I think that would have been the important distinction there. If Tom, while comforting Tom's like – Oh, you're weak. You know, you're sick. That's why you couldn't do it. Tom was just like, hey, you know, it's the first time you've really had to confront full human emotion. No one's going to blame you for, you know, not having a not having both feet in the saddle on that one. But does she actually go on to acknowledge and be like, hey, you know, it's tough being a human out here in the Alpha Quadrant and or I'm sorry, the Delta Quadrant. And, you know, I, I respect the people around me more for the the courage they show under duress because I've seen what it can be like truly now. It's a shame. I think the episode has a, a fault at the end and how it ends. It doesn't. It doesn't resolve well in that that final scene, which we'll we'll eventually get to. So I agree with you in part that there didn't seem to they didn't tie it up, um, which is what I think it, in my opinion, prevents it from being a truly great episode of Star Trek. Uh, but I don't think that takes away from what happens throughout in the performance of Bolana feeling unsteady because she's in this unfamiliar situation. I think they established that well enough, uh, but I I'll, I'll get, go with you on that. She doesn't acknowledge like, for example, that Tom is, is extraordinarily brave, even though he is merely just a human. Yeah. And, and that, that she needs to find this balance where she draws on the strengths of both halves of herself, but also acknowledges that she's more than just the sum of her parts. I think that was the resolution. This episode ends up missing. Yeah. So while she's going on about her daddy issues to Tom Paris, the other Balana is going into some other very uncomfortable issues. <laughs> you want to yeah, walk us through the quote unquote talk? I, it's worth pointing out very briefly because they spend very little time on it, though, that the Scooby squad finds a familiar illusion force field and uh, you did get a quick shot. I don't know if you noticed a smoldering catcher guy on the uh, mm-hmm. at the uh, op station. You she know? actually gave him a name. I didn't catch it, though. Janeway calls him out by name. Uh, I think it was Alaya, Al- Alaya, Lieutenant Alaya. And they, they beam the fuck out. As soon as they spot the Deans, they're like, oh, Jesus. No, nah, fucking cut it out. Let's get the fuck out of here. We don't want our fucking lungs stolen. And uh, they they bounce back to the ship before they get ambushed. So after that, we get, you know, the most romantic scene that we've seen yet. On Voyager. And we've been to Tom Paris's sex farm. We get Klingon Balana putting the Klingon sex eye on Sulan. Straight up telling him Klingon females are that they are the fuck kings of the Alpha Quadrant. They are they 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 bang like tigers. And she's ready to climb all up in Sulan's slimy body 
and and give him the the opportunity of a lifetime, which you know brings in it's flashbacks of the Dura sisters, man. It's all I can think of in that scene. It's like that is straight up some shit the Dura sisters would say. I don't know, man. I'm I'm sitting through this thing, and like even my wife's like, "This is really uncomfortable." I'm like, "Yeah, this is gross." Like, uh, she's basically she's trying to lay down a honeypot situation because she's working her hand in, <laughs> despite all of this amazing Vidian technology they got laying around. Like, their arm shackles aren't made for shit, and like she's already just kind of getting the left arm ready to to rip out of this thing. And uh, that's when Sulan comes up and she starts basically distract him with the sexy time quote unquote the sexy times talk it sounded like some like she even played it like how like larissa and bator would like try and like tempt people and it just it, she makes canon that klingon women love to fuck yeah she plays like, that, that card is, because it felt so much like what we've seen before i i thought it was pretty funny uh, rather than creepy but Sulan's reaction to it actually like really increases your sympathy for him because he kind of sees through it and is like, you know, I'm a person, right? Don't please don't fuck with me like this. Like, I know I'm a hideous monster. I am aware of that. And I just not- injected you with uh, super bad space aids. Let's not forget about that part. <laughs> oh, don't get me wrong. He's still a villain, but he he shows self-awareness. He, he shows a genuine interest. He's you know, like talks more about how he he wants to be something that she desires but he's very much aware that he is not and so he doesn't appreciate being played with like that and you get a moment where you're like oh this this like space mangala guy maybe isn't so bad he's just trying to cure his peoples that's all he's trying to do they they, like give you just enough of that you know Let's let's back this up here, and I'm going to start tapping into why the Vidians are stupid and why Voyager is stupid. You've got a pretty good crew investment down here on the ground, right? And you're dealing with what I'm going to call the most dangerous villains that you have encountered in the Delta Quadrant at this point. Not only are they dangerous, uh, they are horrific, and it is fates worse than death. And foolishly, you've lost some of your best people down there, but you just got found out. The Vidians were sitting there creeping around the corner of the, wa- the, the rock, watching you, like, try and phaser their wall. The force field wall is not dissipating. Okay, the Vidians are on to your shit now, and the Vidians have adapted across the board to compensate for Federation technology, right? Voyager's a big deal, and uh, you might remember the Phage episode where they invited the Phage, the Vidians onto the ship, and they just scanned the hell out of everybody and like basically got a full rundown of what's going on here. Voyager should be a pretty big deal. And uh, now they know you're here in orbit over one of their facilities. The USS Fleshy Pinata is there and ripe for the taking. Like Janeway should have been like, we need to get the fuck out of here before they send in reinforcements because we should be all sorts of tempting. We know their ships are better. And uh, we're in the real danger zone now. And you would think the Vadines would kind of just put a put a just put like a memorial to Tom and and Bellana and Fred Durst and the engineering. You know, have have Bone Thugs see you at the crossroads playing on a loop. Let's just get the fuck out of here. It's just not. Yeah, but you know the Vadines aren't sending you know any sort of uh, parties up to raid Voyager or anything. But it's got to be very clear to the Voyager crew that they know that. The Vidians know that they're up there and are going to be waiting for them down on the surface. So while Janeway's hatching out, you know, this plan of how do we get in there and rescue our three guys who probably just are down there minus their body parts at this point. Uh, and I really feel like Tuvok is starting to cement himself as my voice in this series. I thought it was going to be Neelix before with his open criticism of uh, Janeway's stupid diversions and everything else. But like... uh you know, he's he's laying down truth in this whole episode that, you know, hey, look, these guys are probably dead. We don't know what we're going to find down there. Anybody we set down is going to be additional, you know, organ theft targets like this is a real bad time to be in orbit around this planet. They don't really have time to do that, though. We spend very little time with Voyager. You know, they, they have some techno dialogue and, and eventually, you know, they hatch a plan, of course. But they spend the majority of their time in the prison, mostly with Bolana and mostly dealing with the, I guess you would call the psychoanalysis part of the show um, rather than do that. And I understand that. Like, uh, you know what? 
this is most really supposed to be a character builder for Balana, obviously, as well as give you some more uh, background on the Vidians and establish them more. And, and that's okay. exactly what this is. I think this was they were looking for a way to have Balana reconcile the differences in her head and that the Vidian technology level and their predisposition for, you know, medical meddling um, is what selected them to be the the villains and the vehicle to drive that character split story. I, I think it's doing the Vidians a disservice here and they're coming out looking real stupid. Like this this prison colony that we're dealing in, not only is it there for like medical research, but w- w- what, they're just digging caves for the hell of it? Well, it's unclear if they're mining for something or what, but um, what happens next we see we saw earlier in the episode the inevitable happen, and that's Fred Durst got led away, you know, to have a talk with the person in charge, and uh, he puts up a little little struggle, or Tom does on his behalf, but you know he, he gets led away, and you're like, okay, I expected this. He's about to be harvested for all of his organs because that's what you know, he's the do. one person who's not a main cast member. That's what they do, and he's the one extra dude down here. So kill the spare, right? Like that's mm-hmm. the trope. Well, the next time we see Sulan, um, he he rolls in to talk to Balana, having had like a touching conversation where Balana starts to have doubts about her her plan to escape. Like maybe maybe I should help them out. You know, like you saw it on her face. And she comes rolling in, and he's got a new face. He has Durst's face. And that's when it becomes clear that if you've listened carefully to the voices of both Sulan and Durst, that the same actor is playing both. <laughs> Very clever. Uh, because uh, Sulan has killed Durst and has put his face on in a awkward neckbeard attempt to make Balana uh, more comfortable with him in the, in the room, you know, by... by by looking more familiar and, and wearing a face that she she's familiar with. Like um, the Vidians it, it, don't goes, know at this point after thousands of years of dealing with this shit. Like they don't have a certain guidebook on shit that isn't going to work. Like they don't know that <laughs> cutting off your buddy's face and putting it in on your head like some little hooky damn ass. <laughs> And then, like, rolling up, like, oh, Balana, I've got a surprise. You're going to love this. Look. It's like, do not go full metal and take someone's face and wear it as a mask to impress a girl. Like, this, you may spend too much time vivisecting people to survive, to remember that that is bad, and that everyone will feel bad if you do it. And, <laughs> like, and Durst's face isn't just, like, it's not just like his face, like a good job, like face off where you've got, uh, uh, you know, perfect cutouts and the seams match. Like Durst's face is like applied over a boulder and like from his chin up to like his nose has like ripped and split open so it can accommodate like going on this clearly bigger skull. Uh, and this is where it just really just tips over and like comically bad evil villain time for the Vidians. Like his his showboating of this monstrous feat he's accomplished, thinking that it's going to do anything other than enrage Bolana to like rip herself out of these shackles and strangle his ass like she does. And that's when I start asking all these other hard questions. Like the Vidians can separate Bolana Taurus into a Klingon and then a human, right? Right. From thin air, essentially. They've just replicated out her her Klingon parts and off they go. Is cloning beyond the, the technological grasp of the Vidians? Let me let me back up for a second. One, I completely accept and buy into the concept that Sulan does not understand what he just did is horrific. Or at least as horrific as it should be because these guys spend so much time trying to survive no and killing way. people to survive – I don't know. I get it, dude. I buy that conceit that he didn't understand how awful what he did was going to come off. I wish they had spent more time maybe establishing that, but they, you know, they, they only got 44 minutes and they pretty jam packed in this episode as it is. I mean, their freaking cold open was, was 10 seconds. So I know you don't buy it. I buy it. As far as the technology is concerned though, and this is something that my wife and I actually discussed in depth because she had the same question. It's like, well, if they just made two people out of thin air, why couldn't they just make all the people they need to harvest organs from? Mm-hmm. And I think the answer comes at the end when you understand that both 
human Bolana and Klingon Bolana are essentially unstable. And that if it weren't for the doctor doing amazing doctor things, reintegrating the two, um, that neither would be able to survive. And so what I would presume is that they're unable to basically just to clone or create new organs or people to harvest organs from because those organs are, are inherently flawed by whatever this process is that flawed the two of them. That I, I know they never say that, but that seems to be what they imply. You're being real apologetic. And I, I would say that the Klingon Balana was rock solid because she was the main focus. And there was the leftover parts Balana that was unstable because he didn't give a fuck about her. I think it's well within the Vidian's ability to clone people if they wanted to, and the show's simply not addressing it. You know, the the labor, the slave labor that they have there being used as organ stock. Okay, uh, from a purely monstrous angle, why are you going to take your slave organ pool and stress it out working in the coal mines when you could just have, you know, robots or whatever haul rock, <laughs> conveyor belt haul rocks instead of, uh, you know, the guy who's got the heart you're going to have to potentially give to your brother. Like, well, think about it. Their whole their whole civilization is geared towards medical technology. It could very well be, given how much they've had to focus on just surviving and f- using every tool at their, their disposal to, to make that possible, that they don't necessarily have advanced technology, you know, that isn't directly related no to way, that. dude. So, you're being such a Vidian apologist right now. Like, yes, you ship, know, sign me up. Their ship outran Voyager. They had a asteroid fitted with magic substances that can, you know, reflect phaser fire. They've got instant teleporter, you know, organ stealing technology and superior weapons. Like the Vidians are superior across the board. And they they're, just- they're not good at direct assault, though. I mean, think about when we saw them the first time in Trap Queen, right? The They don't actually conduct a head-on attack on Voyager. They try and lure them into a trap and slowly drain their power because they can't actually beat them in a ship-to-ship fight. They have to basically use cunning and trickery to lure them into a trap where they're slowly bleeding. Yeah, out. that was a ship with like two people on it, though. I, 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 These I, guys hide. They I cower. They stay away from direct conflict and try and ambush. These these guys don't have the technological capability that I think you're implying because they're really good at very specific things to help them survive. Their ships are fast. They have a strong defensive capacity, but they can't fucking fight. They have to trap people and they have to fucking hide from everyone because if everyone was able to get their hands on them, they're obviously going to choke the life out of their rotting skulls because that they're fucking human scavengers. Uh, I, I, I continue to disagree. I think that they're stupid for the... For to meet the needs of the the incompetence level uh, that this episode wanted and being needlessly monstrous to to get that shock value. And I, I think they really squandered a good resource in the Vidians in this episode and it kind of alienated me on it. But back to Sulan and his ill-fitted face. Again, we're talking about race that could like custom fit lungs to, to work perfectly with like nice smooth scenes and again like Durst's face is just like forced onto the sky, literally splitting at the seams. The makeup looks dope. Like, like all criticism oh, and everything yeah. aside, like his face being like sloppily taped onto this other guy's mm-hmm. face looks disgusting and terrible. And uh, it is some A plus special effects work. Uh, in that horrific capacity, the Vidians accomplish everything with an A plus. Absolutely. Oh man, the makeup on this guy playing uh, Sulan after post post Durst uh, uh, face transplant is top oh notch. I don't God, know if it's gonna... dude, that just dawned on me. <laughs> Durst would have been alive had Balana not made the fake sexual passes at Sulan and prompted him to want to become more attractive to her. Durst literally died all for the nookie. <gasps> appropriate yeah that's uh, yeah but yeah Bologna that's totally, how that's how you would want to go that's how you would want to uh with his face know? cut off uh i don't know about that but yeah klingon seduction totally killed durst <laughs> fuck uh Bologna obviously breaks out of her restraints chokes chokes sulan out and then bolts um 
if Voyager figures out a way to get in, you got dudes escaping left and right, and like there's never an alarm sound anywhere. It's like these Badians are running the most sloppy ass slave camp I've ever seen. Well, I mean, it goes to the idea that these guys are are not as 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 solid as you think. Like they're scattered, and and there's not probably not many of them. They are ravaged by disease, and you know they've got they're really again they're really good at certain things, but aren't good at everything else. I think everything you're saying adds evidence to my theory, sir. The theory is that you're so just apologizing it. for the, the the huge plot holes and gaps that are the, all over. The theory is that you just you're not sophisticated enough to just see the pieces that the writers have laid out and said, here, here we've painted the picture for you. All you have to do is pick the pieces. Your internet cred better be fucking garbage after this episode because <laughs> you are so full of shit, dude. It was a pretty interesting scene where uh Torres runs off and saves her human version. They end up operating or there, you know, she sets up camp with a fire, which seems like a real bad yeah. idea in caves, but whatever. And she makes yeah, her some, we do that a lot in Star Trek. Yeah. She cooks up some space rat that looks a lot like a chicken breast and uh kind of bullies the human side. They had a real awkward scene at the end where they kind of like look at each other and I was almost expecting them like in any other situation you would have expected the actors to kiss. Did you get that vibe? And there's still been several episodes of Star Trek where we've had people play themselves or like play two versions of themselves, you know? Yeah. And, and it's always kind of awkward because, you know, you want them on screen at the same time. And you think about like sight lines, for example, the way you shoot the scene, you have to have them at eye level talking to each other, but you have to shoot one half and then shoot the other half. And you kind of have to guess if you've got them, uh, at eye level because you're not exactly sure right and so by reducing the distance you reduce the possibility that you fuck it up so i i get where proximity becomes really important in those shots when you have them on screen at the same time because it's basically a composite of two i thought they did a good job of of shooting that and uh again i think Roxanne dawson did a great job in the scene playing against herself you know, they, they they go through her her psychological, you know, uh, therapy scene there with the fire where she's trying to get to get get at a, a point of peace with her Klingon and human selves. So they can work together to get the fuck out of, you know, organ stealing land. And they they manage to do that. Meanwhile, Voyager has figured out how to get in and they are uh, prepping Chakotay to infiltrate as a Vidian. The doctor has whipped up some some very nice makeup for for Chicote to make him look like a, a rotting space Nazi, and they they beam him in through uh, through a tiny micro hole because apparently Harry Kim is is the crack shot at the transporter we've been looking for. Before long, Chicote encounters Paris and gets him out of there, and they're looking for Bolana, and we get the kind of the final conflict of the episode. How'd you feel about Tuvok knowing the uh, Vidian's garb by heart and being able to replicate it perfectly? Oh, yeah, like, I mean, he did see it. I mean, the Vidians were on the ship, so he had a couple examples to work from and extrapolated something. It hasn't seemed like too far fetched. So we're gonna go. I'm gonna go ahead and chalk it up to uh, a shameful hidden fashion hobby for uh, for Tuvok. He's he's the fashion Eastern. He's he secretly got like a t little bit of Tim Gunn in him, you know. He wants to make it work. I like it. I like it. It's a shame that, that they never like explore that, you know, that his secret fashion, his fashion designer uh, desires. You know, he'd make a, an excellent Project Runway judge. He would be savage. I mean, look how he critiqued the soup at the beginning of the episode. Where you've been wrong about the Vidians at almost every turn here, I'm going to go ahead and say that you're you're hitting the nail on the head here with this Tuvok in sight. I will agree he would have been a perfect runway judge. Well, Chakotay passes his bluff check with the Vidians and they, they respond no, 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 no. to... This is another staple Vidian stupid point here. It, it, this is like one of the... <laughs> hey, I don't know you. you. You don't look familiar guard in this facility with maybe, you know, 15 of us here working. Oh, I just got my face changed. Oh, good enough answer. Like, I don't even like, hey, who are you? What's your name? What's my name? <laughs> what do we I call mean, this yeah. base? <laughs> what the... Who's the Vidian president? Like, you yeah. know. <laughs> I, I get it. It's 
why do that if you're gonna make it that stupid? I know. Man. Like, why why have that scene? But I'm obviously because I'm enlightened and an appreciative of the Vidian storyline in this episode, and not so. Oh, what's what's your unwatched hun? Be like rationalize like my podcast partner. Rationalize this this part of it. What what part of their skittish, mousy, uh, technologically inferior culture uh, led led to this terrible exchange here? Let me hear what you got. Sometimes sometimes Vidians get the brain rot, man. And so, you know, Ralph here, Ralph, he's a low performer because he needs a brain graft. Mm-hmm. And you know, you know, he just he just he 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 didn't know what the next question to ask was, and so he just kind of he just went away. He went back to his console to play what he thinks is solitaire, but is really just a deck of cards, just kind of flipping through on its own. You know, what, or Joe, they're hoping to come through for this guy. Good job, Joe. That, that that excuse is as good as every other excuse you've provided in the Vidian's defense <laughs> so far. Good. That was oh, okay. a good one. So, Obviously, this scene, that little shot sucked, but everything else makes sense to me. How about and you, and you, how about and, you, and you're a barbarian? You're a fucking barbarian. Peter. How about this? When he turned around to like you know challenge Chakotay, he realized that Chakotay was so fucking boring. All that guy wanted to do was just get the hell out of there. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't like, actually care. He's like, this dude sucks. He's boring, and I want to leave. You seem like a C-tier actor. I don't think I want to do much more dialogue with you. I'm, you know, I'm going to get out of here before you start scratching rocks and make a real fucking mess. And I'm going to have to <laughs> clean up. So uh, they they get to the, the main laboratory room where Bolana and, and Bolana are attempting to affect escape by accessing the console there. They're going to kill and, the cloaking uh, or the, basically disable all the um, – the perimeter defenses drop the security shields and let them and presumably the rest of everybody else who's there get away you know they could just beam everyone out and uh they they succeed in doing that because of the timely intervention of of uh chakotay and paris into the standoff uh that they have sulan's back. Uh, but sulan's back he's got one of the the super Fadian guns trained on the pair of them. Uh, and Klingon Bolana is, is banking on the fact that Sulan's unwilling to kill her because Klingon Bolana is, of course, potentially a ticket towards the cure of the phage. Uh, but human Bolana succeeds, it raises Voyager, and they're about to bounce before Sulan decides to, to from hell's heart, I stab at thee and take a pot shot at human Bolana. But Klingon Bolana jumps on the bullet and takes the shot for the team and they get the rest of them out of there right afterwards. And and Sulan lets out a a quick anguished cry of having both shot his potential F buddy slash cure to the horrible rotting disease that has plagued his race nigh into a thousand generations. And they they wind back up on Voyager where Klingon Bolana has just enough time to lay down some dramatic last words, uh, uh, commending human Balana's bravery and ingenuity in getting them off. Any any snarky comments about how Vidian sucked? Do you want to sneak sneak in there before we move on? Or are, are you done? Are you full? Dude, I could go on. I mean, I, the the vid- <laughs> uh, I'll do it in the recap. But uh, I did want to say that yeah, they right. did leave the Talaxian water boy to die. Very cold. Yeah, they the did. Crew. They left the Talaxian dude there that suddenly was like being real friendly and giving him water and all this other stuff. He's left there to die. Anybody else that's down there that's that's not a Vidian, they're all, they're their kidneys are going in some motherfucker tomorrow. They're they're just they're cruel. just all di- they're all dead. It's very cruel, I thought of uh, of our command crew that has observed the suffering down on the surface and uh, is content to just tuck tail and run the hell out of there. <laughs> like we're, we're searching the, you know, these systems looking for stuff to do and things to see. Oh, <laughs> there's a torture camp. Better get the fuck out of here and just turn a blind eye. The episode's uh, button is seen in sick bay where the doctor relates to Balana. Hey, I'm gonna gonna have to start taking uh, the DNA from your deceased Klingon self and reintegrating it with your human self because whatever this shit the Vidians did to you to separate you makes it so that you can't synthesize protein. So you're gonna fucking die if I don't. So I'm gonna work on that and we're gonna fix you back up. 
And Bellana has a monologue with Chakotay there where she explains how at peace she's feeling being separated from her Klingon self, yet she recognizes the strength this other part of her life gives her. And that even in death, that part of her life is going to save her again. And there was an opportunity there for some of the stuff we talked about to to round the episode out, to, to, to put a little bit of a bow on her journey. But instead, they do the very awkward choice of having Chakotay not respond and just kind of walk out while Bolana sits there with all this emotional weight on her, unable to really conclude her experience. Yeah. You've got some options at this point. Uh, my money would have been on them both being able to exist fine as separate entities. And, you know, this reconciliation between them saying, Hey, I need you, you need me. And maybe we work better as a team and, for whatever reason, we have access to rejoin us and, and Bellana make the choice to say, you know, what made me strong was the mixture of these two things. I want to go back to being and have these two sides willingly go back and not the Klingon part dying and then human Bellana having an arm twisted behind her back like, well, either you get this reintroduced or you die. I also think it's kind of silly that it was cool the way they separated her, you know, with advanced technology that split her. Uh, but just basic gene therapy, remaking her a half Klingon, half human hybrid again. I don't know. It doesn't really work for me. I thought they could have popped her back in the transporter and done a, a fusion there to make it a little bit more feasible. I agree with you that the, there's a weakness in how there wasn't a, an active choice to reintegrate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I agree technologically it would have made much more sense because the way they explained it was very reminiscent of the transporter that they used the transporter to basically recombine them uh, efficiently and effectively. And to be clear, I'm not doubting that the doctor can't just put some pills in her food and turn her clean. I mean, after all, this is the guy who can undo death itself. Like nothing is beyond the right. EMH's uh, <laughs> icy medical grasp, but – uh, did anybody in the crew know that the cure to the phage was potentially sitting in Klingon? Uh, Bolana, did she ever disclose that to anybody? I'll be interesting to see. If, I don't recall. Um, you know, the Vidians are an antagonist for the first couple seasons, mm-hmm. but they do eventually stop showing up. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if there was a ton of opportunity where it would have been relevant to those stories. Would have been strong bargaining chip for, uh, you know, uh, Jane way to be like, hey, look, here's this dead body, and maybe it can help you guys out. And there's one episode the coming up where, if it's going to come up, it's going to be the one I'm thinking of where they they really readdress like the phage is a disease again, and 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 it'll be interesting to see if it does come up. Then that would be some solid continuity if it did. But while we're at uh, pointing um, out some plot holes here too, uh, Bellana has been infected with the phage. They've brought this bad body back up. They've never really established how the phase is transmitted, if it's something that just is in the air or in the blood or saliva transplant. I mean, obviously, it's going from generation to generation, so it has to be infectious somehow. Like, you know, you, you just brought another big problem on the ship, but hey, if you can take caretaker smallpox, then no reason to care about the, the phage being on the ship and, and alive and well either. You know, some things get, like in any Star Trek episode, get a little hand waved. Well, there's a lot getting hand waved here. I mean, but that that as a as a uh, that particular detail getting hand waved is not nearly as bad as completely forgetting that you infected Kim and Torres with space caretaker syphilis and never resolving it. Like it just it just it's a major thing. They're going to die from it. And then it just goes away and you never actually have addressed it. That's a much bigger error than you get to the end of the episode. Clearly Bolana has is as a Klingon is, is resistant to the phage. Uh, but you don't address like her potentially transmitting or anything like that with a single line of dialogue. Okay. That's not nearly as bad as, as the caretaker yeah. plot hole. So, you know, apples and oranges. There, well, at the end of the, the, the day with this episode i felt it was a strong episode they did some really cool stuff um some some great character development it was a fun 
you know, interaction, getting to see some of the other Delta Quadrant species who are being marched down Cardassian hallway um, and interact with them. But, you know, you took something that I really liked, the phage and the Vidians, you know, the Vidian race, and just dumbed them down to, to real comic book villain level garbage uh, to accomplish a story about Balana and uh, I was sad to see that happen. You've, you've demonstrated this technological might they have and punched so many holes in the story. Again, why aren't they using clone materials? Why are they having, you know, slaves? Why are they really just wallowing in this monstrous villainy needlessly and, and undermining any sort of sympathy for him? I think the episode gives you the answers to all those. Th- I'm serious though. Like, their technological proficiency at medical science is at the expense of other things that they've spent so much time as part of this monstrous collective that they're not understanding their behavior in context of any of everyone else anymore. And that they, they succeed through trickery and deceit and traps and very specific technological innovations rather than straight up conflict and there's a, an inherent limitation uh, because of Phage's interaction with cloned material or of the inherent instability in cloning uh, that they that's not the solution. I think all of that is out there in pieces in this episode for you to to accept. And I think I think that the Vidians are not as as one note comic booky as you have interpreted them to be, my friend. But that's okay. I still value. And treasure you as as not only a personal friend for more than a decade, but as a valued podcast partner. I want to I want to validate you. You're full of shit, and I hope your face gets cut off and sloppily pasted on a two dimensional <laughs> villain. They 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 fucked up good okay. villains and they squandered okay. resources. So we're going to agree to disagree on that. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I will say I I I I would say that it is a couple key errors away from being a truly great episode of Star Trek. And from in my opinion, uh, but it is still a good one. I will say, you know, it, out of the from my wife's reaction, that if you are a type of person that comes from a divided background, um, particularly of like a, a cultural or racial background, this probably speaks to you in a way that for you and I, two white dudes, um, maybe not so much. So your mileage may vary, friends, if if that's the case. Um, so. I wanted to touch on one more topic, though. I want to go back. The whole soul thing. I I want to lay my hot take on you, my friend. Here it is. The soul is part, is your DNA, is the whole of your DNA. That's what it is. And Balana was, was separated into two beings, but both were incomplete and both were unable to, to survive without the other. And as a consequence, neither were soulless. Both were simply diminished until they were reintegrated with each other. No. <laughs> Dude, she got loaded. <laughs> no punches no. with you. You're just done. You're just like soulless. She's soulless. What, what, what's what's the thing in uh, med labs that uh, centrifuge? She got put in a digital centrifuge. And she got whipped into right. two separate parts, and the top part, the Klingon part, got skimmed off and reconstituted, and the leftover part got reconstituted. That soul is gone. That soul is in the machine. She is in the uh, the Tuvok, Kim, Chakotay, now Torres, uh, Soulless Club. Nice try. All right, all right, all right. I, I had to give it an attempt here. So, uh, next episode. Um, we are are looking at Jatrell is the name of it, and I don't have Netflix handy. Hold on, do you? No, but while you're looking at that, I want to go ahead and give a special shout out to uh, if you're one of our newer listeners, we're happy to have you. Whoever listened to this episode heard a fine intro of the uh, Voyager uh, theme song as uh, portrayed by a recorder to friends of the show. Um, Ian and Sarah, who uh, were responsible for creating our uh, our intro music with the stipulation that they do it in one take and try and make it sound as bad as these two seasoned musicians possibly can. 
So uh, big thanks to them. It's been a while since we've done a shout out and uh, we appreciate you. Absolutely. Uh, we, we can't emphasize enough that um, they came through on that uh, unasked and unbidden after we expressed a desire for that kind of, of theme, like a, a shitty recorder version of the Voyager theme for our podcast. And uh, they made it as, as bad as they could with people with genuine And even their worst talent. is still what I would constitute as too good. <laughs> <laughs> but but still perfect. I mean, it really, it, it shows their artistry. Uh, so the next episode is is Jatrell and a description on Netflix for this one. Neelix is diagnosed with a fatal illness by a Hakonian named Mabor Jatrell. Is this fatal illness That's that he's got bogus lungs or a bogus lung? <laughs> Think about this. <laughs> he's got a space elf yeah. lung and it's going to fucking fall out as yeah, an acid like nine years or something. Like fucking yeah. spare tire. That's uh, not rated for seven years worth of mileage, man. There's your episode. Yeah. Whoop, uh, this is a hot uh, Conan. Yeah. And we haven't met them yet. We're going to get some, some background on, on space mm. nerfs, nerfs. And uh, what's well, up with them? Harding words episode, on my so. end. And I think this one's especially fitting. Sulan, who uh, was of course uh, the main evil doctor in this one, falling in love with Klingon Balana uh, in the new species that could have uh, heralded the, uh, the end of their terrible phage. Uh, Ferengi rule of acquisition number 203. New customers are like razor tooth gree worms. They can be succulent, but sometimes, as he found out, they bite back. Oh, yeah. Especially with those fangs, man. Yeah, those wooden teeth. Ugh. Well, this will do it for Viger Police for this week. Uh, my name is Joseph. I'm Peter. And uh, we thank you for listening. Please uh, like us on Facebook, share this podcast with your friends. And give us reviews if you feel so inclined. If you've liked the show in particular, tell us all about it. You can even join our V'ger Please trauma support group. Or if you'd like, email us at v'gerplease at gmail.com. See you next week. 